The scripture reading today is from Matthew 18, 21 through 35. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began a settlement, a man who owed him ten thousand bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me, and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours, yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant, just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Well, good morning, everyone, to our uh, service uh, at the Crossing Church on Sunday morning. We're glad that you decided to spend a few minutes with us. We are continuing in our series on forgiveness. Uh, and so uh, I'm so glad you decided to join us for this part five of this series. And uh, let me uh, start off uh, by telling you that if you went to high school in the United States when I went to high school, the chances were really, really high that you probably read Charles Dickens' uh, memorable classic novel, Great Expectations, in your English literature class, right? A lot of you did, I'm sure. In that book, there's an eccentric old lady by the name of Miss Haversham. By the time the reader actually meets this unusual person in the story, it's her birthday. Now, years earlier, on this very calendar day, she had been dressing for her wedding, waiting for her fiancé to arrive. But at 20 minutes till nine, she received the numbing word that her groom had run away with another woman and would therefore not be coming now or ever. From that moment on, life literally stopped for Miss Haversham. Every clock in her house was stopped precisely at the fateful hour of 20 minutes till nine. Heavy uh, drapes were hung in the windows, blocking out all sunlight from her dim and even really dingy home. She lived in seclusion with her adopted daughter, a girl by the name of Estella, uh, while the wedding cake and feast lay rotting on the table, spiders carrying off the cake and the food bits by bits, piece by piece, scurrying audibly into the walls. Most vivid of all, the jilted bride-to-be continued to wear the now fragile dress and wedding veil she had been wearing at the moment of her tragedy. Their colors long since faded and yellowed, their lace and fabric literally by that point in tatters. And to the main character of the story, Pip, who had arrived at her house uh, through his attraction to Estella, he, well, he naturally wonders, you know, why this spectacle is taking place. Miss Haversham, in one scene, standing near the once grand wedding cake, gives this depressing analysis. She said, On this day of the year, long before you were born, this heap of decay was brought here. It and I have worn away together. 
The mice have gnawed at it, and sharper teeth than the teeth of mice have gnawed at me. Nancy DeMoss, in her book, Choosing Forgiveness, commenting on the dreadful scene in Dickens' novel, said, Those teeth were, and are, the sharp edges of bitterness, resentment, and unforgiveness. Tearing deeper than the flesh wounds of claw and fang, these knife-like protrusions can pierce far beneath the skin, eating away at our joy, eroding peace, and closing our hearts off to the sunlight of God's presence. Question this morning. Who or what or what is it that may have eroded your peace? Who has closed off God's practical presence in your life? An unfaithful spouse? Neglectful, unresponsive parents? Memories of sexual abuse? Cruel children? Overbearing bosses who have tossed you away? Insensitive in-laws? Employees that stole from you? Maybe, maybe a teacher who had made sport of you in class? Or even fiancés? that never showed up. What was it? You know, at the beginning you were hurt, then you were angry. But it didn't stay there. It never does. Soon bitterness tore at you like the pangs, like the fangs of, 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 of a ravenous wolf pack. You know, the writer of Hebrews said this. He said, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. It's no wonder bitterness is called the cancer of the soul, a cancer that always, always spreads and always nullifies the grace of God that could have been. Now, let me say this. If you have decided that you will indeed live life not cocooned in a cave somewhere, but out and about among people, you will be hurt you will be wounded at some point. You will have ample opportunity, yeah, to be bitter. But it is just so debilitating. Bitterness causes our stomachs to churn all day, our minds to storm all night, and our souls to turn black with hatred as we plot real or sometimes imaginary revenge. It is your unresolved bitterness that often is the real cause of the fractured marriage, the divided family, the broken business partnership, even the divided church. Some of us have seen that. You know, often we can admit to ourselves and, and to others the sin of anxiety or sin of worry or lust or depression, but often we cannot or do not admit to our anger because a lot of times we've hidden it so deep into the subterranean caves of our inner life that we're not even fully aware of it ourselves. But it is affecting us. Mark my words. Sometimes we know it's there, but we just minimize it. We always minimize just how mad we continue to be. But our anger twists us. It makes us cynical. It makes us hard. It's like having a continual low-grade spiritual fever that goes on and on and on and on. Is there a way to know if hurt has turned to anger and morphed into bitterness in your life? How can you tell? Well, you know what I want to do right now? I'm going to ask just about eight questions. And if you have a piece of paper, grab it. If you have a pencil, grab it and just write down a number uh, to the questions I'm going to be asking. One through eight. And you can put down zero, one, two, or three, the num numerals right right there next to the questions, okay? Um, and uh, uh, once you do that, then we can come up with some statements and see if maybe bitterness is playing a, a, you know, a, a big part of your life. So here's, here's the first question, okay? I don't know if you got a pencil and paper, but at least use your, use your fingers, okay, to count up. First question. I often rely or, or replay in my mind an incident or incidences that have hurt me. I often replay in my mind an incident or incidences that have hurt me. Perhaps others have told you, you know, just get over it, but you haven't. Maybe you can't. 
If that seldom happens to you, zero. Sometimes put a one next to question one. Often put a two. All the time. Okay, that's three points. Second question. When I think of a particular person or situation, I feel angry. This goes to the emotional side of things, folks. It has to do with heart rate and clenched teeth and furrowed brow. Again, seldom, if that's seldom true, zero. Sometimes one, often two, all the time, three. How you doing? Number three, I try hard not to think about a person, an event, or circumstance that caused me so much pain. You have to mentally restrain yourself when you see someone doing something you don't like from saying, oh, I know who that reminds me of, stuff like that. Seldom, one, sometimes, two, often, three, all the time. Question four. I have a subtle secret desire to see this person pay for what he or she has done to me. You say things like, oh, I hope somehow, sometime, he gets what's coming to him, preferably before Judgment Day. Seldom, zero. Sometimes, one. Often, two. All the time, three. Question five. Deep in my heart, I have to admit that I wouldn't mind if something bad happened to the person who hurt me. You know, you hear of bad things that maybe happened to this person, you say, oh, that's, that's too bad. You know, you get the this little faint smile, okay? Uh, you, you know, you could, people could see. Seldom, zero. Sometimes one, often two. All the time, three. Question six, hang in there. I find myself telling others how this person has hurt me. I find myself telling others how this person has hurt me. Did I ever tell you what so-and-so did to me? Seldom, zero. Sometimes, one. Often, two. All the time, three. Question seven. Many of my conversations were... revolve around the situation. Many of my conversations revolve around the situation. Almost like a, you know, it's like if you have a favorite television show or movie whose the taglines you've memorized, you could bring it almost into any conversation. You can always find a way to bring this situation up. Is that true of you? Seldom, zero, sometimes one, often two, all the time three. Last one. Here we go. When his or her name comes up, I'm more likely to say something negative than positive about this person. In fact, you you can't recall the last time you actually said anything positive about this person. Seldom, zero. Sometimes, one. Often, two. All the time, three. Okay. Add it up. Can you do the math real quick? Here's what I think this means. If you scored anywhere zero to four, you're probably not struggling with bitterness in your life. It's this message that you're hearing and you're about to hear the rest of it. Um, It may be good for you maybe in the future. It may be good for you to help a brother or a sister or a mother or a father or somebody else, you know, to refer them. But right now, this is not, this is really not a, too much of a problem with you. And, you know, listen though, you, you please stay with us. Okay. If you scored five to eight, You may, you may be struggling with bitterness in areas that are affecting your life, okay? Maybe you are, maybe you're not, not sure. It's it's not something to be ignored, but it's not a huge debilitating factor, I don't think, in your life. Nine to 12. If you scored anywhere from a nine to a 12, then I could say you are struggling with bitterness that has probably already affected your life. This person or this situation is affecting you in ways you may not even realize. If you scored 13 to 16, folks, you have a major struggle with bitterness, which is it's absolutely affecting your life and the people around you. If you scored 17 to 20, you have a serious debilitating problem with bitterness. And if you scored 21 to 24, then I I feel somewhat confident to say that, unfortunately, right now, 
you are a very angry and bitter person, which in all probability has done major damage to relationships in your life, and it's killing you. Like a small pebble, you know, you're walking along the road, you pick it up, it goes in your shoe, you're walking down the road, you try to shake it to one side or the other, you know, but to the side of your foot, but it never goes away, it's always there. It's, it's always there. So we strike back in new and inventive ways. It's the cold shoulder, it's the bad report, it's the gossip, it's the lies, it's the character assassination. And yet, as debilitating and destructive as it all is, there is something in us, it almost, um, it almost revels in the darkness. It does. Frederick Beekner wrote this. He said, of the seven deadly sins, anger is the most fun. To lick your wounds, to smack your lips over grievance long past, to roll over your tongue the prospect of bitter confrontation still to come, to savor the last toothsome morsel of the pain you are giving back to them in many ways is a feast fit for a king. The chief drawback is that what you are wolfing down at this feast is yourself. The skeleton at the feast is you. Yet we don't think of that. Our thoughts are to get back at someone to make them suffer, and to make sure they know why they're suffering. The last thing we want is for the person who wounded us to throw you a a surfacey apology like a 50-cent gratuity and go on our way. We want them to twist and roast like a pig on a rotisserie. Look at that verse again. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Anger and bitterness that results from it, it's, uh, it's called a root in this meta- metaphor. Well, what's a root? Well, a root is the deepest part of the, the, deepest part of the tree, right? Every, everything, uh, everything springs up from the roots. And yet there is an answer. The answer is found in a two-syllable word, which is, Beautiful in its meaning, seemingly impossible in its demands, and yet, when fully entered into, provides the means for many to escape a prison of their own design, design, while at the same time doing that which makes them most like their Heavenly Father. You know what the word is? I think you know. The word is forgive. Now, in preparation to answering the question, what is forgiveness, because that's That's the next thing we got to do. Let me say this in preparation to answering that. When you are wounded, when you have been sinned against, there are two and only two ways that you will react. Just two. First way is you could become a debt collector, choosing the path of bitterness and resentment, setting out to make the offender pay for what he owes, deciding on both the appropriate penalty and when It's been paid, and holding them hostage until it has been paid. Or, or you can choose to become a debt absorber, which basically means that you decide to absorb the cost of the debt yourself. The debt doesn't go away by itself. It it has to be paid by someone. We're going to be talking more about that next week. When you react to someone who has sinned against you by becoming a debt absorber, you pay the price yourself and refuse to exact the price out of that person in any way, I might add. You free them from the penalty for a sin committed against you by paying the price yourself. It's pretending that a, it's 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 not pretending that an offense uh, didn't happen. It's it's determining to absorb the pain into yourself. That absorbing that that paying the price takes a lot of forms, but it always includes one thing, folks. It always includes personal pain, which obviously, for some of you, reminds you of someone else. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32 says this, Be kind and compassionate to one another, 
forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. So, what is forgiveness? Well, forgiveness is when you choose to refuse to make another person pay for their sin against you, but instead choose to absorb the debt yourself, to bear the cost yourself. See, forgiveness is choosing not to be a debt collector, but a debt absorber. Now, next week we'll talk about how you forgive, but in the little bit of time I have left this morning, I want to briefly answer the why question. Why is the capacity to be a debt absorber, someone who forgives those who have hurt us, so vitally important? Why? Why is it so important to be a debt absorber? Well, the first thing, and I, I, I think it's, it's the biggest thing, I forgive, I become a debt absorber because it indicates one thing above everything else. It indicates that I've been forgiven myself. The story that was read from Matthew 18 begins by introducing a king who, getting wind of some irregularities in the accounting department of his kingdom, gets all the royal accountants together and discovers to his shock that there is a man who owes him really an almost unbelievable amount. It's it's an amount that's just hard to believe. How he ended up owing the money uh, can only be speculated upon. We aren't privy to everything in the story, but there are a couple of things that we do know from the story. For instance, we do know how much he owed. Verse 24 computes it out at 10,000 talents of silver. Now, that may sound like a lot of money, but it's much more than a lot of money. 10,000 talents of silver probably represented more than the entire annual income of the king. One has said that it was, it was more than the actual coinage and circulation in Egypt at the time. Now, I calculated it out because I kind of like to do stuff like that. And I figured if you were a blue-collar guy working for an average wage, it would have taken him 2,857 lifetimes to pay it all back. Well, not only do we know how much he owed, we also know the penalty for one who could not pay back what he owed in those days. It was common practice that when a man or his family could not come up with the cash to pay his debts, the man and even his wife and children could be sold as slaves to the highest bidder to recoup at least a portion of the losses. Now, the average price then for a slave was between 500 and 2,000 days of wages. Pretty expensive. But even by selling the man, the guy was only going to receive back a tiny fraction, a fraction of what he had stolen from him. Another thing we know is how the, debt, how the debtor reacted, how the servant reacted. And I find his reaction very interesting, but more than that, I find it very revealing. Verse 26 records it, his reaction. It says this, The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. I'll pay you back everything. Now, you're reading that. Look, you you don't have to be a a member of Menza to realize that this guy is stalling for time, okay? He's, 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 this guy is no dope, Anybody who could figure out a way to finagle the books to such a high degree of proficiency, even if he did eventually get caught, he's got some talent and some smarts. I mean, every now and then, a Bertie Madoff or a Sam Bankman does come along. And this guy figures if, if, if given some more time, maybe, you know, he's such a smart guy, he could figure a way out of this mess. I just need a little bit more time. See, these guys always think they can work their ways out of a mess, right? They always do. If that was the case, we could probably accuse him of arrogance as well as theft. Surely no one in the room during that confrontation would have believed that he could pay it back. But you know what? He was blind. What the servant didn't see was that he had broken faith with the king who had trusted him. But worse than that, he had broken the king's heart. Because often what is missed is that when we break trust, 
we break hearts as well. And I have to wonder if he really understood that. We sin against one another. We spew out careless words, engage in careless, selfish actions. We break trust with one another. And when it becomes apparent what we have done, we metaphorically beg for time to make it all better. Flowers, a stumbling apology, a promise of good behavior, that's what's needed here. But flowers rarely heal a broken heart. And yet, and yet, there was something in this servant's plea that moved the heart of the one he had wounded. And his reaction was something that was really most unexpected. See, the servant asked for time, but what he got instead was what he needed most, and that was forgiveness. The Apostle Peter wrote, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Peter wrote, For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. You know, a lot of times we think of our sins as trivial, something, you know, really small. But when we look at our sins as small, then we look at forgiveness as cheap. But it's not. We think of them as, as simple, a simple condition of the human race with a kind of a pass of the hand. That's just the way things are. What we need to do is to step back and see the real results of our sins against God and against one another. When we look at the cross, we see God's verdict on sin, and it's terrible, terrible price. When we look and really see, then we will not think them trivial, and then we will know the real cost of forgiveness. Charles Spurgeon, the prince of preachers of a century and a half ago, wrote this. He said, we go to Calvary to learn how we may be forgiven, and we linger there to learn how to forgive. See, when Christ forgave us, he assumed my guilt. He took upon himself the awful result of my sin. He determined to pay the price that my sins incurred. He died to make things right again between myself and my Creator. When we forgive, we assume the pain, we assume the embarrassment, the consequences that may or has happened because of another's indiscretion. Is it any wonder why we have such a difficult time forgiving? Forgiveness is the gracious act of pardon on the part of one who has been scorned to one who has sinned against them. Verse 27 says, The servant's master took pity on him, and he canceled the debt, and he let him go. The hymn writer said, Calvary covers it all, my past with its sin and stain, my guilt and despair, Jesus took on him there, and Calvary covers it all. End he was free. So what do you think the response of someone like that who has experienced such a great forgiveness, what do you think the response should be? Do you think it should change his or her heart? Do you think it would change the way they deal with others? You would, you would think so, right? If we truly understand how much we have been forgiven, you just can't remain the person you were. But this servant that Jesus tells us about seems to not have understood that at all. For we read in the passage that that servant, still, still basking in the sunshine of the royal mercy, he goes out and immediately bumps into someone who owed him a relatively small amount, certainly an amount that could have been paid back if given a little time. And surely after having been forgiven so much, I mean, mere secular logic would dictate that he would extend a morsel of grace that had been extended to him to someone else, right? But the servant shows that he had not internalized the principle of grace at all. 
He really didn't understand the grace extended to him, so he couldn't extend it to someone else. The first and best reason why we should forgive is because we have been forgiven so much ourselves. And when we become debt absorbers, when we extend forgiveness to those who have sinned against us, pretty good indicator that we understand how much we have been forgiven of. But, but if we callously, arrogantly decide in our heart to withhold even the thought of forgiveness, well, it shows that we really don't understand what we've been forgiven from. Perhaps, perhaps we never understood it. Because a forgiven person is a forgiving person. But there's another reason why we forgive. You forgive, I forgive, because it keeps me from torment. See, when the king found out what had happened and how unmercifully the servant he had forgiven acted towards his fellow servant, in, in a fury he called him in. And he yelled at him in verse 32, and he said, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. And, folks, since the debt could never be paid in prison, the punishment would go on forever. Look, I know that in one sense, Jesus was talking about the eternal torturer in, his, in this passage, about being turned out to a place where you forever experience the eternal wrath and judgment of God. I, I get that. But in a secondary sense, when we refuse to forgive, we literally turn ourselves over to temporary jailers who, in obvious and not so obvious ways, make life on planet Earth miserable, just like Miss Haversham in Dickens' novel, just like her. And sooner or later, we're going to have to deal with it. Do you for a minute think that there is no relationship whatsoever between the tortures of mental, emotion, emotional, and physical disorders and the fact that we are stuck in the mire of bitterness and unforgiveness? Really? Do you? Even secular psychologists write about the relationship of anger and resentment and physiological problems. High blood pressure, heart disease, hormonal changes, impaired immune systems, memory loss, even back pain are increasingly being linked to unresolved anger. You know what you should do when, when I'm done? Go Google anger and sickness, anger and sickness, uh, you know, and see how many articles come up. Folks, you know what's going to come up? Pages and pages of articles. See, you have handed yourself over to the torturers. Now, I'm not saying all sickness is due to anger and has no organic roots whatsoever, but I think you are foolish to think that there is never linkage between the two. Though her fiancé married another, Miss Haversham lived a wasted life of pain and torture. See, Jesus linked a refusal to forgive with God turning us over to the tormentors. But when you refuse to make another person pay for their sin against you, but instead absorb the debt, taking it on yourself, well, then you've begun to forgive. Forgiveness is refusing to be a debt collector, but instead choosing to be a debt absorber, to bear the cost yourself. When we absorb the pain of those who have sinned against us, we are most like our Savior, and we keep ourselves from the tor tormentors now and forever. Many of you are familiar with the name Corrie Ten Boom. Corrie Ten Boom was a Dutch woman who, along with her sister Betsy, lived in the Netherlands during World War II. During the Holocaust, they hid Jews from the Nazis, but were eventually caught and confined in the concentration camp at Ravensbrück. In the dehumanizing conditions in that camp, she was not only humiliated and degraded, but had to watch helplessly 
as the life of her dear sister Betsy wasted away until she died. Corey did survive the war. After her miraculous release from prison, she became a Bible teacher and speaker, and she would go around in Europe and give testimony and preach God's forgiveness. She tells the story that happened just a few years after the conclusion of World War II. She writes, At a church service in Munich where I was speaking, I saw him. The former SS man who had stood guard at the so-called shower room door at the processing center at Ravensbrück. With the other guards, he would often run his hand over naked bodies as they went by and responded callously to requests for help. He was the first of our actual jailers that I have ever seen after the war, and suddenly it was all there again. The heaps of clothing, Betsy's pained, blanched face, and when he came up to me as the church was emptying, he said, How grateful I am for your message, Fraulein, to think that, as you say, he has washed away my sins. She continued, His hand was thrust out to shake mine, but my hand stayed at my side. Angry, vengeful thoughts boiled through me, and I tried to smile, and I struggled to raise my hand, but I could not. I silently prayed, Jesus, I cannot forgive him. Give me your forgiveness. As I took his hand, the most incredible thing happened. From my shoulder and all along my arm and through my hand, a current seemed to pass. While into my heart sprang a love for this stranger that quite literally almost overwhelmed me. See, as she reached out her hand and spoke her forgiveness, she felt another burden of the past fall away. She was finally free. When you choose to refuse to make another person pay for their sin against you, but instead absorb the debt, taking it on yourself, you are forgiven. Forgiveness is refusing to be a debt collector, but instead choosing to be a debt absorber, bearing the cost yourself. But you know what? To refrain from lashing out at someone when you want to do so with all your being, it's agony. It is in itself almost a form of suffering. Because you not only suffer the original loss of happiness and reputation and opportunity, but now you forego the consolation of inflicting the same pain on them. You're absorbing the debt, taking the cost of it completely on yourself instead of taking it out on the other person, and it hurts terribly. Many people would say it feels, well, it feels like a kind of death itself. Yes, but it is a death that leads, the Bible says, to resurrection instead of the lifelong living death of bitterness and cynicism. Tim Keller, in his book, The Reason for God, wrote this. Should it surprise us then when, that when God determined to forgive us rather than punish us for all the ways we have wronged him and one another, that he went to the cross in the person of Jesus Christ and died there? On the cross, we see God doing visibly and cosmically what every human being must do to forgive someone, though on an infinitely greater scale. There was a debt to be paid. God himself paid it. There was a penalty to be borne. God himself bore it. Forgiveness is always a form of costly suffering. It is. Forgiveness means bearing the cost instead of making the wrongdoer do it. So you can reach out in love to seek your enemy's renewal and change. Forgiveness means absorbing the debt of the sin yourself. We do it because it shows who, whose we are. We do it to escape the torment 
that bitterness brings. When we choose to refuse to be a debt collector, but instead choose to be a debt absorber, we will experience nails, we will experience blood, and we will experience tears. But, but in doing so, we show that we understand the mercy shown us, and we keep ourselves from the tormentors, now and forever. And so, Father, today, uh, you know who's listening, you know who's hearing this message, and uh, for those who, um, while we didn't do so well in the little quiz, we've come to realize that we have a lot of bitterness stored inside of us. Maybe we knew before then. God, I pray that uh, through your grace and through the example of Jesus Christ who gave his very life for us so that we can be forgiven, we would decide to become debt absorbers, oh God pulling in the pain into ourselves, into our chest, O oh God, and kind of smothering it and extending a hand of love. Father, we pray that you'd help us do that. We can't do it ourselves. You, you know the pain. And for, for so many in the audience, the pain is really desperately deep. But God, they've carried it too long. They've carried it for a really long time. And I pray that you would just help them this day to begin the process of forgiveness and to be freed from this heavy burden. Because of what Jesus did for us, we can do it. So help us now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks for being with us, folks. And uh, next week, we are going to put a bow on this short series on forgiveness, and I hope you're going to be with us. God bless you. Have a great week.